Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. Tonight our panel of medical experts will be talking about the diagnosis and treatment of lower GI problems ranging from constipation and colitis to diverticulitis and colon cancer. I'm your host Dr. Alan Johns from the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School Duluth. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists tonight. Dr. Daniel McKee, a gastroenterologist with Northland Gastroenterology. Dr. Daniel Opheim, a general surgeon with St. Luke's Surgical Associates. And Dr. James Wise, a gastroenterologist with Essentia Health Duluth Clinic. Our medical students answering phones tonight are Elena Hinsela of Duluth, Maya Johnson from St. James, and Madison Wegg of Worthington, Minnesota. We're ready to take our que your questions, so give us a call locally at 218-788-2844 or toll free at 1-877-307-8762. And now on to tonight's program on lower GI problems. Well, Dr. McKee, in the intro, they mentioned one of the topics was diverticulitis, but um, What's, uh, people have diverticulosis. What's the difference between diverticulosis and diverticulitis? Well, diverticulosis is the presence of little out pouchings or pockets in the colon. It's very, very common, especially as folks get older. Diverticulitis is when one of those pockets r obtains a, a small rupture and becomes inflamed or infected. Okay, well, thank you. Dr. Opheim. You're a surgeon and do gastro, gastroenterology surgery and colon surgery and that. Now, in, in the old days, they used to make large incisions in order to do surgery. Do, do you do surgery differently now than they yeah. used to do it? Yes, we do. We do uh, laparoscopy, and now over the last uh, four to five years, we've actually started doing robotic surgery. Same, same concept as laparoscopy, but uh, small incisions, and we extract the specimen through a small incision. People's pay, postoperative pain out of the hospital quicker, uh, things at, that add benefit to uh, colon rectal surgery. A um, uh, large amount of people um, have a lot of benefits from doing it lapar laparoscopically. And, and with, the, with the robotics. Absolutely. Oh, yep. Interesting. Yep. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wise, another uh, thing that was mentioned in the lead-in was, was about colitis. And now, uh, Tell me about colitis in a nutshell. I mean, it's several potential illnesses, right? It's not just one. Yeah, colitis is, uh, you know, broadly, you know, defined as, as inflammation in the lining of the colon. So, you know, uh, like we would get uh, a cold in our nose or get inflamed and red and swollen. The same thing can happen in your colon. You get uh, inflamed and mm -hmm. uh, often patients will experience uh, abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, and sometimes uh, bleeding. And uh, colitis can be caused from various different things, uh, such as um, uh, infection mainly is one of the most common causes, uh, uh, also from uh, un unde undetermined inflammation, such as in Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, and even drugs can cause colitis and various other things. Uh, a common hospital uh, reason people go in the hospital is because they lose blood flow to part of their colon. They call that ischemic colitis, but there's, sort of, there's, a, there's a lot of different causes of colitis. Thank you. Dr. McKee, we have a caller here from Duluth who wants to know, are there any effective over-the-counter therapies for hemorrhoids? Oh, sure, yeah. Especially if hemorrhoids aren't particularly large or there aren't complications of the hemorrhoids, such as a clot forming in the hemorrhoid. So with uncomplicated hemorrhoids, um, over-the-counter treatments that are effective are hydrocortisone cream, um, if the underlying cause of the hemorrhoid is constipation, which is oftentimes the case using stool softeners so that you're not straining to have bowel movements in conjunction with, with say, a 1% hydrocortisone cream is oftentimes effective. And they were wondering about internal hemorrhoids, so, so would there be suppositories in that too? Yep, yep. There, there's, uh, there are cortisone suppositories that can be used as well. Okay, well, thank you. Dr. Opheim, um, a, a caller here was wondering about surgery for diverticulitis. When, sure. uh, when, it, when do you do that? Is that something that's so, done right away? Yeah, or? So current recommendations by the American Society for Colorectal Surgeons 
you know, 10, 10 years ago, we say, you know, if you had two bouts of uncomplicated diverticulitis, you'd have part of, take out part of that colon that was diseased. Now we know that we've actually been doing too many operations on patients and really haven't been benefiting them. So now it's a case by case basis. We look at how many bouts they've had in a certain time frame. If it's been, um, if they've been in the hospital for IV antibiotic therapy. Um, there's a lot of kind of things that we have to take into account nowadays. And the, the basic kind of tenants are um, complicated bouts of diverticulitis, are p people that would benefit from a surgical resection. Those patients would be people that have had an abscess from their diverticulitis. They've had a stricture, have had a fistula, or if they have, have perforated diverticulitis that require emergent operations. Mm -hmm. so those are the kind of the, the key guidelines we do for complicated diverticulitis. Now, uncomplicated ones, those people that just need oral antibiotics or IV antibiotics in the hospital for a couple days, usually it's about three to four bouts, we say, or again, that case-by-case -case basis. Um, we have to kind of take everybody's um, uh, individual kind of um, case into account and to make that determination. It's not a strict kind of guideline right now. So, oh, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Wise, a caller from Duluth would like to know, do they have a cure for Crohn's yet? I could answer that, the answer would be no, but, but there's, some, there's some really good treatments for it now. Is that right? Yeah, well, Crohn's disease treatment has uh, basically exploded over the last 10 years with biologic therapies. Um, and we're commonly giving uh, uh, these treatments to people. Many of them are, they're injectables, which are basically, uh, some are given under the skin and some are given intravenously. And they, they help uh, suppress certain uh, parts of the immune system to some extent to help with the, with the, the immune system attacking the, the, the small bowel or colon and Crohn's disease. And there have been these patients that we had in the past that we couldn't get under control with Crohn's disease who were had very active, uncontrollable disease who've found a lot of relief and have uh, felt better on, on these new therapies. So that's, that's really good news. Great. Thank you. We have a caller from, from um, Superior who would like to know, uh, Dr. McKee, about short gut. I mean, uh, what, well, maybe you could describe briefly what short gut is. And are the, the caller would like to know, are there any foods that would stay in the system longer to help that out? Well, short gut is an uncommon um, condition. It's usually the result of some complication resulting in surgery, such as um, um, inadequate blood flow requiring resection of a large amount of the small intestine, or it can happen in folks with, say, Crohn's disease who had multiple surgeries resulting in multiple resections of the small bowel. But for whatever reason, if you've had enough of your small bowel removed, you can develop what's called um, um, short gut is one term for it, but, um, but that's a condition and it, it can be very difficult to manage because there is a, a reduced surface area of the small intestine to absorb the foods that we eat. And um, in terms of diet, uh, yeah, there are foods that are absorbed more slowly. Fats, for example, traverse the intestine more slowly, but it's usually treated with um, diet manipulation, using foods, um, taking small amounts at a time, not eating, say, three large meals at a time like folks would normally do, and using sometimes el what are called elemental diets, which are more easily digested, mm -hmm. um, which are liquid types of, of food supplements but it's, it's an uncommon condition and it's mm -hmm. very difficult to manage at times. Thank you. Dr. O'Connor, a caller from uh, Gilbert would like to know, is there such a thing as an intestinal transplant such as after cancer or resection? Yeah, th there is. Um, they're uh, actually in, in Omaha they're at the University of Nebraska. They actually do intestinal transplants, not usually for, for cancer, usually it's for actually infants that have lost a large portion of their small bowel. And there's certain individuals as an adult <coughs> that, that, would, uh, that potentially could benefit sometimes shortcut syndrome being one of those issues. Where they just don't have the surface area to absorb the nutrients that they require to, to survive. Um, most of those people kind of survive on total parental nutrition for a long period of time before that, you know, a transplant is discussed. But usually when you're talking about, you know, either small bowel malignancies or malignancies in general, usually people are off that, that transplant list because of that. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. 
Dr. Wise, we have a couple of callers here, and this is a common condition, constipation. They're just wondering, how do you treat chronic constipation? Uh, one caller was wondering, is drinking warm wa a lot of warm water each day helpful? Well, water is helpful for constipation. Uh, constipation is very common and a troublesome uh, a condition where people are straining at bowel movements and not being able to pass, uh, pass their bowel motions as, as frequently as normal. Uh, basically, uh, constipation can be thought of in two different ways. One is a simple constipation that would respond to uh, lifestyle modifications such as like a high fiber diet, um, drinking lots of water, uh, walking, exercise, uh, such as that, and, and complicated constipation, which would uh, kind of entail things that are not going to respond to that, basically. So we have uh, therapies we can offer that are over the counter therapies, such as la different types of laxatives. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if it's a really severe constipation, we go into more detail and trying to figure out. It, you know, is this slow transit constipation? Is is the stool not being moving th moved through the colon uh, because the colon isn't working quite right, or is it is it getting stuck? Is it not coming out? We call mm -hmm. that uh, anal outlet dysfunction or pelvic floor dysfunction. And so those those latter two uh, categories are a little bit tougher to treat. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Dr. McKee. Our caller from Duluth uh, would like to know what are some signs and symptoms of colon cancer. Well, um, there are a number of different signs and symptoms. Um, typical symptoms of colon cancer could be change in bowel habits, new onset of constipation, although sometimes diarrhea, um, lower abdominal cramping, uh, narrowing of stool caliber, blood, new onset of blood in the stool. Um, in more advanced colon cancer, there might be weight loss, loss of appetite, um, and a combination of those things would be even more worrisome than any one of those symptoms uh, alone. Thank you. Dr. Opine, uh, a caller from Duluth would like to know about appendicitis and, and do you always have to have surgery for appendicitis or are there ways to treat it with antibiotics now? Sure, so um, there's some recent evidence that says if it's a very uncomplicated bout of appendicitis then there's some role in that. Um, the gold standard treatment is an appendectomy, um, and that's kind of what we've, that's our standard of care in this region, is to do an appendectomy once we see that. Because we know that if we do um, exclude that source, that what we call source control, mm -hmm. that patients do get better. Now, you ex expose patients to risks of a surgery, but those are very minimal compared to the worse outcome, and that's perforated appendicitis and potentially sure. could be life threatening. Sure. So, yeah. Thank you. Yep. That's why a uh, caller from Duluth would like to know the value of probiotics and also fecal transplants, are they being done in Duluth? I guess that's a two question. Yeah, uh, probiotics, m most of my patients swear by probiotics. There, a lot of them are taking them and their evidence about probiotics is mixed, but it, it's, it certainly seems like a, a good idea if you're having problems with your bowels to introduce good flora. Um, so I would have to say I, I, there, there's not a lot of evidence for probiotics. People mm -hmm. uh, are taking them and, and, and reporting positive effects. Um, as far as fecal transplant goes, uh, that is something that uh, was actually in the United States, at least developed in Duluth, and uh, it is done here in Duluth still. Um, we do it uh, at Essentia, um, and uh, it is effective for treatment of uh, vancomycin-dependent Clostridium difficile, which is a a bug that people get from taking antibiotics um, or from uh, get, getting it from somewhere and not being able to fight it off it causes it's a colitis it causes diarrhea so for people who take the the antibiotics that that treat that but they can't get off them it just keeps coming back uh, we, we offer the stool transplantation and there are various ways of having that done um, and you know the the stool is put down through a, a nasogastric tube and in some cases some cases it's delivered through a colonoscope through the colon um, and I know they have an active program down at the University of Minnesota as well, and they do treat people who are uh, um, in, sick in the hospital, which we, we mm -hmm. tend to do more of outpatient therapy here, but anyway. So the answer is yes. Oh, great. Okay, Dr. Dr. McKee, a caller from Park Falls, Wisconsin, would like to know wine and beer, how do they affect the, the, the GI tract, <laughs> is it, or the, the bowel? Is it, uh, I guess, good or bad, or hard to know? Um, 
in in moderation, probably neither good or bad. Um, probably not much of an effect one way or the other. Um, lots of alcohol can cause inflammation in the lining of the stomach and the upper part of the small intestine. So bad, um, but. A, casual alcohol consumption, whether it be wine or beer, um, probably isn't a, a big deal. Um, both of any kind of alcohol consumption will increase acid reflux, so um, if you're prone to, or, to that problem, there's, I suppose there's that issue, but uh, I, suppose, I would say that th those are the, the issues as far as wine and beer are concerned, not, not, not too much as far as the GI tract is concerned, especially in moderation. Sure. Well, good news, I yeah. guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Opie. A caller from Virginia would like to know gallstones. Now, do you, uh, what are the treatment options for gallstones? I mean, surgery, of course, is one, but right. yeah, I mean, uh, what, do you have, what do you do with gallstones? So, so, so uh, how we develop gallstones is kind of complex, but uh, you know, the liver usually secretes bile, it comes down and hits a little muscle called the sphincter of Odi that is contracting when we're not eating it. And, that bile then backs up and goes into the gallbladder. Our gallbladder's job is to store bile and then concentrate it down. Well, sometimes what can happen is you store it and you concentrate it down so much that cholesterol, which is in bile salts, kind of um, precipitates out into a crystal form and then eventually snowballs into a gallstone. Well, not millions of people walk around every day and they don't even know they have gallstones. So we only really talk about surgery is when they're giving people symptoms. That's usually pain, in the right per quadrant, usually about an hour. It can be any time after eating, but usually about half hour to an hour after, after eating, you get kind of this vague dullness and eventually it can sometimes exacerbate into severe pain. Usually that lasts for anywhere from half hour to an hour to two hours. Sometimes people can get a stone that gets lodged in the neck of the gallbladder that can cause acute cholecystitis. Sometimes stones can actually migrate into the common bile duct, that's the duct that connects the liver to the small bowel and that can cause cholangitis or pancreatitis. So we usually deal with, in terms of a surgical standpoint, is when they start giving people symptoms. So vast majority of people, if you have a CT scan or ultrasound that shows they have gallstones, if you're not having symptoms related to that, I would say leave it alone. Okay, well thanks, that's helpful. Yeah. Dr. Wise, we have a couple of callers here asking about irritable bowel syndrome. Basically to discuss what it is and what's, some easy treatments for it, okay. if there's anything easy. Well, irritable bowel syndrome is uh, a very common problem where uh, people have uh, complaints about the stool consistency and it, uh, it's associated with uh, feeling uh, pain in the abdomen. So if uh, in, there are various different uh, classifications when irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, and then irritable bowel syndrome, they're alternating between constipation and diarrhea. And so they would typically, if you had constipation of this, uh, you have this abdominal pain, it gets better when you have a bowel movement. Um, and and it, it's not defined as classic constipation. Um, uh, and that's a little bit technical. I could get into that. That's a little confusing. But uh, irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, you, you're, you're having cramping abdominal pain and then, and then having diarrhea. And what, what makes something irritable bowel syndrome really is a diagnosis of exclusion. So, you know, we look at the, is the patient healthy? How long have they had the condition for? Um, and, and, and so if you have a disease, a colitis of some kind, for example, that could be causing diarrhea. Um, it, it is usually associated with losing blood and weight loss or looking sick in some way. Um, colonoscopy could be done to look and see, make sure that you're, you don't have colitis. And often uh, these tests are done to exclude uh, some other condition that might be causing uh, that. And uh, often will exclude celiac disease, for example, or uh, something that uh, might be causing uh, diarrhea or constipation in a patient. Um, so it's a diagnosis of exclusion. It, may, it looks like other diseases, but it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's generally it, not clear what causes it. It's thought that uh, about a quarter of the cases of uh, irritable bowel syndrome occur after an acute gastroenteritis. So someone gets an infection and they clear the infection, but they keep on having these bowel symptoms and uh, they go on and sometimes on and on. And so it can be uh, very troublesome. For, for some people, it, it, it's mild. Some people, it's, it's re relatively severe. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. McKee, Dr. Wise just mentioned colonoscopy. Um, let's get on the, that topic briefly. What, wh when should people have colonoscopies as a uh, routine colonoscopy, say, screening? Well, for colon cancer screening, 
if their so-called average risk, meaning there isn't a significant family history of colon cancer and they're not having any of the symptoms we discussed earlier, uh, the guidelines are currently for Caucasians beginning at age 50 and for African Americans at age 45. And, and then the next exam would be based on the results of the first, but if the exam is negative, so there are no precancerous polyps, then uh, repeat colonoscopies every 10 years. Um, but colonoscopies are done obviously for other reasons other than for cancer screening, but for cancer screening that would be the answer. Thank you. Um, Dr. Opheim, what other common types of gastroenterology surgery is there? We've talked about gallbladder and we've talked about diverticulitis. Mm -hmm. Colon cancer, I guess, would be one. Colon cancer. There's other operations that we do for inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Specifically for ulcerative colitis, we can, if people are refractory to the medical therapy that they're receiving, if they have an emergent colitis and eventually perforate from that colitis, we do, you know, total abdominal colectomies, total proctocolectomies, what we call iliopouch anal anastomosis, kind of recreate the rectum from small bowel, and then eventually, you know, patients can have a normal bowel movement. Um, other ones are for Crohn's disease, so segmental small bowel resections and colectomies related to their Crohn's disease. So, yeah. well, well, thank you. Dr. Wise, here's a caller. I can answer this question. What type of doctor would diagnose celiac disease? Well, how about a gastroenterologist? But, so let's talk about celiac disease for a second. What, what, um, what's that all about? Well, any, any doctor could diagnose celiac disease. Um, uh, it's a very common condition. It's, it's uh, about one in 300 people in the population are thought to have celiac disease. And uh, celiac disease is uh, really an inflammation in the, in the usually the proximal small intestine that happens because of the presence of gluten uh, and, and it interacts with elements of the immune system that attacks the small bowel. And it results in uh, uh, variable symptoms, but the classics are diarrhea, weight loss, um, uh, some mild abdominal pain and iron deficiency anemia. And it does respond to removal of gluten, which is, which is in, in wheat and, and barley and rye. And so if you remove those grains um, from the diet, or it's also in, unfortunately, in lots of food, different kinds of food and in medicine. So if you have to remove gluten, yeah, it's better you see a dietitian that can go through everything that mm -hmm. you would need to do to have a, a gluten-free diet. And gluten-free diets are becoming more acceptable over time as, as time goes on, but it's, uh, it's a big deal. Well, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dr. McKee, a caller from Duluth would like to know, are apples or bananas bad for you in moderation? Uh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty easy one. I think they're probably both really good for you in moderation. That's great. Uh, uh, Dr. Opheim, a caller that, that would like to, from Duluth, no, from Grand Marais would like to know, are bloating and gas part of aging? Um, not necessarily, no. <laughs> Um, it can happen any time in your lifetime. Um, in certain, you know, concerning symptoms, but if that, that bloating and distension results in your abdomen becoming more distended, if you've had prior operations, we worry about what we call small bowel obstructions related to their previous operations causing scar tissue. But if it is persistent, uh, I would obviously seek medical care. Yeah. Thank you. That's why a caller from Cloquet would like to know, hey, sudden onset of explosive diarrhea, mucusy, mucusy. Uh, does that sound, uh, I'm just asking, does that sound like uh, it could be irritable bowel or what, what is that? Well, yeah, I guess the, the, it depends on how sudden and uh, generally when we think about diarrhea, we think about how long someone's had it. Mm -hmm. So if it's uh, only been just suddenly or recently, uh, it's probably an infection. Okay. People get uh, generally, every, you know, every two years, every individual in society gets a gastroenteritis. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very common to get that. Uh, if it's been going on for a long time uh, and you're doing well, yeah, it could be irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so it's, it really depends on you know, how long you've had the, the problem. So the person needs to get to see their physician and get some more, Absolutely, get yeah. some more history done yeah. and, and that's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, and it's, if, you, if you're dehydrated and not, not, uh, not able to, to take in PO, you have gotta get to the hospital. Thank you. Well, just one final question here uh, and then we have to go. Um, 
Are there any, uh, Dr. McKee, uh, is there anything that if you have st soft stools that, and you tend to leak stool a little bit, is there something simple that can be done? Yeah, oftentimes, and that's a really common problem and it's a pretty distressing problem for folks who have it. And, and the, the term for that is fecal incontinence. Oftentimes, adding a fiber supplement like citrusyl, one or two tablespoons a day, mm -hmm. and then adding to that uh, a real low dose of loperamide, the brand name is Imodium, mm -hmm. um, maybe just a half a tablet once or twice a day okay. is, is enough well. and, and that will frequently take care of it. Well, thank you, gosh. We're out of time, so I'd certainly like to thank our panelists tonight, Dr. Daniel McKee, Dr. Daniel Ofheim, and Dr. James Weiss, and our medical student volunteers, Elena Hinsela, Maya Johnson, and Madison Wegg. Please join Dr. Ray Christensen next week for a program on ENT problems when his panelists will be Dr. David Choquette, Dr. Jonathan Glickstein, and Dr. Adi Lakari. Thank you for watching. Good night.